from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This time we're going to go into a specific set of games that we refer to as banking games. We can't talk about the history of board and card games without talking about the transactional element of games. So for this one, all of them will involve tokens of some sort. And don't worry, we will be talking about the history of the tokens themselves. But this is a series of games for leisure that used to be only for the nobility, but have started to be for the working class as well. These are banking games. Let's get stuck in. So banking games are going to be a style of game in which you have someone who is a banker. Uh, in this case, we've got two different types of bankers here. We've got either me as a non-player being the banker or rotationally around someone being the banker or dealer. The concept of someone being the dealer each hand is pretty common among card games, but these banking style games are ones that have an extra added element. So. The dealer in this game is going to be somebody who rotates around. The players, or what are called punters, are going to be another element to this. Now, what I'm going to talk about are these are games of chance, of luck, of uh, gambling. So uh, this is where I'm going to traditionally say that this is an example no means of advice of how to play. This is just to show you the development of games. But we can't talk about these types of games without talking about their past history of being used for financial transactions. And don't worry, we'll get also into how people cheat at each of these games. So this one is probably the most common ancestor to this style of game. It's a game called Basset. This one originated in France, uh, correction, in Italy, and then became very popular in France to the point where French royalty actually banned this game because too many people were losing money. So what we're going to have is I'm going to talk about card decks for a second. Each of these are four separate suits. of spades, clubs, hearts, and diamonds. And each of these suits has a certain number. This is a French style deck. So ace, which can be either low or high. A lot of these games, ace is gonna be just a one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then our court cards, a jack, a queen, and a king. So unless I tell you otherwise, assume that this is the kind of deck we're going to be dealing with. So we are going to have four specific players. These decks will be divided into suits. This is referred to as a book. You can either have a book be the entire suit together, or you can have a book be the full combination of all four aces, all four twos, However, we're going to divvy this up into different groups. So I'm going to put these all kind of opposing each other. We'll put this off to the side. So this is a game that can have as many as seven players. We also have the dealer. This is known as the Talieri. And uh, we have our own deck, which is complete. Now, this looks preposterously large. Why do I have it like this? Well, it is entirely because in a game of two to three players, you use one deck of cards. But with four players, we're going to use two decks of cards. So if you have been watching any of this series, you know that I often talk about the importance of shuffling. So now this is kind of important because how do you shuffle a deck when there's more than one deck? 
we've got a couple options. You're probably most familiar with talking about cutting the deck into and then holding it. This one's a little harder than normal because for one deck, we'd just be able to do this flip. You're gonna take your thumb, hold it opposing, and then just let some cards go. But see, with two decks, it becomes a little, uh, shall we say, unwieldy. That was mostly okay done, but let's give this one more shot, shall we? That's a little better. It still becomes unwieldy, but it is doable with some practice. If you're wanting to learn to shuffle decks, I would strongly recommend giving them some practice if you're gonna do more than one. We can also kind of create just a nice fun little pile here. Now this is mostly just doing rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. However, you can kind of make this go a little out of order. Now I went and shuffled this well before we started filming today. So I'm gonna actually turn this away for a specific reason. The top card isn't always the card that we draw from. The bottom card sometimes does indeed come into play. So for here, the suit's irrelevant, but what I'm gonna do is notice I have a giant stack of uh, chips, tokens, however you wanna to refer to it, all of them have denominations on them. And just real quick, I'll show you which denominations they have. We've got ones, fives, 25s, 50s, hundreds. This one's always the one that runs away from me. Come on, there we go. Five hundreds and one thousands. So this scales up fairly consistently. But what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to give everybody just a small stack of tokens to kind of work with. And then what's going to be happening is we are going to be determining what card comes next. So let me go ahead and give everybody just a small amount of chips and then I will show you the way this game works. One second, get this set up got this set up and everybody's been given uh, just a nice little stack of healthy cards here. And what we're gonna do is each player is going to pick a certain number of cards. You can do any, you can do all, where you're going to place some sort of bet on one of these cards. So you can do as many as you like. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna say one, basically kind of go in a nice little rotation here because I want for this example at least one person is going to surely have to win here uh, simply because of the way that this game works. So you'll get the five, you will get the six. So essentially your odds are going to be dependent on what happens next. Three, seven. Let's go and find the eight, and we'll be able to keep some of the clutter out of this. Put the nine. So it just goes in a nice order here. Ten. Jack. I should really learn my suits, shouldn't I, before putting out cards. Note that this happens all the time, but for me, this is part of the enjoyment of the game. No one's getting a king on this one. So three, seven, and jack will be this player. Four, eight, and queen will be this player. Ace, the five, and the nine, and the two, six, and the 10. So what's gonna happen here is each player is gonna say, okay, I want six. We'll just have people kind of pick some numbers out of what they'd like to bet. Someone feels really lucky, they'll put 25 on six, because why not? You can do this however you like. Somebody put 10 here, two here, and put six here. Someone says, I really want it to be a queen. 
and you'll see why I am by no means an expert here in just a moment. So everybody has now placed a certain amount of coinage on each of these. So what's going to happen is, you remember, I shuffled these. I have no idea what's on the bottom. You don't either. I will be turning a single card over from the bottom of the deck. At this point, anything that's on the bottom of the deck, if it matches one of these cards, the dealer, note here, is winning. Now, in most games, what happens is I'll have a stack of this myself. So let's just go ahead and for simplicity's sake, let's add as though I'm a fifth player. I think that might help with this example. Just a teensy bit. That's, that's 10. So notice that right now, I don't have any bets. And I'm sure you're wondering, why is that? Well, I'm about to make a certain amount of coinage either way. Because since everyone has made some sort of bet, the dealer is going to be the person who wins any bets that match this rank. So I don't have anything at the moment. And notice I've got a reserve stash because eventually what will happen is, oh, hey, look. So now what I'm going to do is on my end, I'm going to take the very bottom of this card, this off to the side. And at this moment, whichever card is here that matches the rank, not the suit, suit doesn't matter here, but the rank, I'm going to win whatever it is here. It's the six. So remember how the person who bet the 25 on the six, they instantly lose that bet. And the dealer, I'm just gonna put this so that we can see what the winning is, then says, okay, the six. So now we're gonna put our six off to the side. The dealer gets to keep that one. Yes, this is the way that it's gonna work with rotation that even if you're doing poorly, because you're getting the winnings here, you are gonna be doing just fine. So now, where do we go from here? We're gonna do some cards from the top. The first card here, which will be to my left, will be a card that wins their bet. The second card will be one that loses their bet. So we're gonna put this off to the side again. The ace. So this person who put six on each, what's gonna happen is they're going to win from the banker, six. So we'll put their nice little winnings here. And then the person that is gonna match here, the six. The good news is they've already lost, so they can't lose any further. Notice that everything else is sitting here. What's going on? now? Here's the fun challenge. All the bets stay the same. You know, stuff isn't resolved yet. That's totally fine. This person can actually win more. So now they've got their original stake, which was six, and they've got their winnings, which was one to one. You have a card that is now in paroli or uh, parole, essentially. Another round will be dealt if this card wins, so there has to be an ace somewhere in one of the winning cards. So it'll be this left deal, and it can't be here or there. They will win seven to one. Not bad, right? So let's say they decide to do that. Everybody keeps their stuff the same. Now, here's where it pays to pay attention to what cards have been dealt. So six can only lose theoretically six more times. So this person say, all right, well, I'll make my money back eventually, surely. Again, this is where things get complex. So this is kind of like the second stage. No one else is in this little second stage. So now I'm gonna deal from the bottom. The eight automatically loses. The four automatically wins. So notice here we've got one, we've got two, 
And we got one. So this person's one. And nominally, what happens is usually it gets paid out from the banker themselves. Uh, but in the meantime, we're just going to use this large stash of stuff just to make it easier on all of our souls, especially mine. The three automatically loses. And we're going to do some comparison points so you can see just how it changes. So now we're going to keep this going. Remember the four won. So they say, all right, we're going to keep going. So we've got our automatically loser, the seven. The automatic, oh no, see, I goofed. We're going to just do that again. The seven will be actually our winner on this one. See, this happens a lot and why it pays to pay attention. The five will be our automatic loser. So, and then what else loses? The ace. So I was waiting for this one to happen. This means that the ace being its loser, you lose all of it. This is what happens. If the ace had been over here, they would have actually won their bet again. So we'll keep going. Notice that there's kind of wait on the seven. This four is now in that paroli status. So we'll get our card from the bottom. Jack automatically loses. Our winner, our six. So that's our 25 over here and our loser again, the eight which we'll say that person kind of replaced that bet. So they'll lose it again. Notice how you've got a pretty good stack going on and no one's made it to a stage two yet. We've got our loser, the ace. Let's say they didn't replace their bet. That was on me. They'll put the 10 on the five. We've got our winner, 10 over here. And then we've got another loser, the king. No one has the king out, so everything's fine. I want to see if I can get somebody to the second stage so I can explain to you how it scales. So our loser, king, everybody's safe on that one. Our winner, the ace. Notice how this person's stack got pretty small, pretty fast. And our loser, the eight. We'll do it one more time just to kind of get it closer. We'll say the three is the loser. The queen is winner. And our three is actually a loser. So as people have been counting, if you've been kind of counting these cards, you kind of know what's left, what's easier to win or lose. So notice how no one has gotten a seven to one payoff, even though we've gone through a couple of rounds. Some of these have lost more than once already, but with what's left, in theory, you've got okay-ish odds. Now let's kind of look at what's been paid out versus what's been lost. So, so far we've got six, we've got another six here, we've got 11 here, we've got two here, we've got 50 and 25. So let's kind of do the math here. So that's 12, 14, 14 and 11 is 35, 50, so that's 85. So we've got 100 and 110 that's been paid out. Thank you, math. Meanwhile, the other person, 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, 71. So they're kind of down 40. Now, notice the second stage hasn't punished anybody yet. They will get this 25 back if a six is drawn, if a queen comes up soon, which by the way, notice how only one card out of three wins, meaning that this 50 and probably also this 50 is coming home soon. This game escalates because once you win this seven to one, which may happen, you then can paroli again for winnings of 15 to one. So let's take a look at this. 
uh, 50 right here. So the payout for that being seven to one, that's 350, not bad. Then it's 15 to one. Notice how your risk reward escalates very quickly. But notice your odds are pretty, uh, shall we say, low. There's a reason that French royalty banned this game because this is off 50, they've won 100. Now they're trying to get 350, but they lose all of that, including their original bet. So you think, oh, I'm only down 50. Yeah, that's not going to work out super well considering your odds of losing are two out of every three cards. This is why, on the whole, this game would get dangerous. But this is probably the origination game. There's other different types of games that had more social elements. One second, I'm gonna reset this board and then we'll kind of go from there as to what happens next. One second. So the origin of banking games brings us to Italy in the 15th century. A Venetian noble is credited with really turning some of these games into what they are now. There are numerous literary references that take place in this time period. One of the biggest things about this type of game is it was explicitly held for nobility. So in order to talk about nobility, I have to go to the one place that we always seem to go to, France, the courts of France, the courts of one of the many King Louis. More on that in a second. So I went ahead and reset up. Everybody has their same stake amount. We're gonna take the uh, book element out for a minute. Uh, this is another social based game called Las Canettes. Um, it's actually pretty close to the German Landsknecht, which is a uh, medieval pikeman. It's a military unit. But uh, the French and German have a lot of crossover words in their complex history. So what we're going to do is, as I've mentioned before about shuffling, it's always important to shuffle. And make sure that you do this as thoroughly as possible. So this is a social game that does involve a uh, banker, and that's why we've given everybody an equal stake, minus the 500 piece that randomly disappeared. I promise I'm not trying to put the house in my favor. But don't worry, the house always wins. So what I'm going to do is, if I am the dealer, I'm the banker, and this is where everybody has to match a stake if you want to, shall we say, deal in. So just for simplicity's sake, we're gonna say that my stake is 25. Everybody who wishes to participate has to put in 25. So now what we're going to do is I'm gonna be dealing out only two cards first. There's the banker and then the other card. If these cards match, then the banker shall win. Pretty easy, right? What I'm then going to do is we are going to go back and forth, try and match cards. So now here's the way this works. Neither card matches. So play is going to quickly continue on. This one can be resolved fairly quickly. So now if this left card matches, the banker gets all of these stakes. If the right card matches, the banker will deal out the stake in fourths. So let's see what happens. Does it match? Does it match? Does it match? And we're looking for this original card. Mm -hmm. 
This is absolutely a game of suspense. Where you're trying to get, oh, we're close. We need a queen or an ace. This will be shuffled even more. Ah, here we are, the queen. So once we get our matching card, almost went off the table, the dealer of this wins the stake as the banker. Not bad. So now you have a choice. If you are the banker, you can continue to play. So let's say that you decide to play one more time. So you're going to get your stake here, and I'll keep the winning part over here. We'll just have the regular bet, and let's say, ah, we'll just do five this round. So everybody puts their stakes back in. Play will usually uh, pass around uh, fairly often, but for the moment, we're going to just have this be the player and the dealer card. And since that was an in-order deck, we'll probably get a little bit more variance this time. Because notice we had a lot of those uh, hit cards or numbered cards come together compared to the court cards. So now, here is the jack or the king. Whichever one shows up first. So I will win as the banker if the jack shows up. The players will win if the king shows up. Once again, I have won. So we'll just keep those winnings there. Notice how obviously the risk here is going to be fairly high. But I've done reasonably OK for myself. Now what I can then do is play can pass. And I say, you know, I don't feel like risking it anymore. I want to theoretically win my money back the other way. The next player has to buy the bank equal to the stake that would have been next. So this is five. So 25 was the total winning. So the next person says, OK, I can buy the bank, but I have to pay in 25. Let's say they do that. So now everybody has this new equal stake. Put this here. So now this is the person who is buying the bank and has the potential for winning. So their card is an eight. Everyone else is a 10. So now are we going to get an eight or a 10 first? You can go through a decent chunk of the deck in theory because we're looking for only two cards. So it's six out of the remaining stack. Now notice this 10 means that person has to pay out, which means that this entire stake being 125, everybody is going to get their cut of this 25. So I'm just going to put this off to the side. So one, two, three, four, and then we'll just say that it's divvied up for the moment. Five. So notice how that was air quotes, the right decision to pass and let the other person buy the bank. Now, obviously that was only the loss of like 25, but notice how much money has changed hands literally already. This person has made a decent stack in of what they had out. This is where, again, the game can scale quite a bit, but this concept stays relatively the same throughout the course of playing any of these types of games. Play will indeed continue on around until everybody basically agrees to stop, play a different game. But between Bassett and Lance Canet, about the only difference here was instead of trying to bet on specific cards to come out, there was betting on 
an outcome that was basically more even to the dealer or the banker. Instead of your odds of losing being two thirds, your odds of losing were 50-50. However, you're just getting a cut of this hand compared to having that paroli or escalation option like the set. This is where different types of games are made out of the same family of games. So, uh, Lanskinet and Basset are two different types of games. There's much more of different styles. Give me just a minute. I'm going to reset this up, make it easier for everybody else. And then I'm going to show you yet another type of game. One second. Now, if you've seen other episodes of this series, you hear about two locations of the world fairly often, France and China. China is probably the creation story of most board and card games in either their format or the original invention of their pieces themselves. Think Mahjong, think playing cards. All of them kind of originated in China. But the French seem to be a very common stopping point on the way for many of these board and card games. So if China's the creation, then usually the courts of French kings are the completion, or at least the next stage of completion. Usually there would be one other place, which I'll get to in a moment, but a large amount of 16th, 17th, 18th century French court, French court intrigue, stories involved the idea of leisure time and gameplay, which did involve, well, gambling. We cannot talk about the history of board and card games without talking about the money transactional financial element. So like I said, there's one other stopping point that's pretty important. Germany. More on that in a second. Here is another type of game. Instead of it being a uh, specific deal, this is just three cards. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two cards face up and then one card face down. The entire premise of this game, Monte Bank, is what suit is this card going to be? Now notice we've got 50-50 option, which means that again, it's favored to the banker again. Oh no. So what we're going to do is instead of this being five players, it's just going to be four. And this is our lovely introduction to the concept of the house always wins because the payout for this is one to one. If you bet correctly, great. However, the house always wins because since the payout's one to one, let's say we even made it two to one. Over time, you're probably going to lose unless you're getting lucky. This is a luck based game. I haven't done anything with the hands. I don't know how to count cards. Uh, I don't know how to shuffle intentionally to rig the game in my favor. So let's say what we're going to do is we're going to make this instead of one to one, we'll make it two to one. So one to one that it's not going to be either of these. So if this card is a spade or it is a club. I'm going to pay out two for every one that you put in. So let's say that for this example, you're going to put in one that's going to be this, one that's going to be this, one, and one. And I'm, no, I'm kind of keeping the corners the same for this one. So I'm going to flip over this card as an example. It's a heart, which means that this person, sorry, since I'm doing the banker here, this person wins one, this person wins one, and these people lose their stakes. This is just simply the way it works. So let's say, all right, cool. They've gotten their winnings here. That's the original stake. Just trying to keep this a little easier for cleanup and vision reasons. Great, they have their stake. Now, we're going to completely have two options here. One, if you are just playing a quick
quick round and you're intending this to be fast, you can actually make this fun by leaving these out and saying, okay, well, now it's much less likely that two hearts have shown up. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna shuffle these in. We now had the same equal chance that we had before. And I'm sure you're thinking, hmm, why are we doing it like that? Well, in this way, I paid out to, I lost to, I stayed pretty even. If I'm the house, I like my odds because eventually people are gonna start uh, betting, shall we say, more. I keep my hand even. You still net lost because what's gonna happen is eventually we're gonna make this club, spade, and a face down card. This was even. Now let's say, fine, we're gonna do a five. Five. Everyone thinks that the next card up is going to be a club. Again, pays out one to one. So either I'm going to be out 20 or I'm going to be gaining 20 if I'm the banker. What do we get? All of this is now gone. So now let's throw in that extra layer. Again, the house always wins because sure, that last round, I did okay for myself. This is completely a game of chance. So I'm gonna do a jack and notice how both of these are the same suit. So what I'm actually gonna do is typically what'll happen here is we're gonna deal another card or maybe shuffle and redeal to where we get this. So for simplicity's sake, you now know there's a whole lot fewer jacks. I'll play my face down, or sorry, a whole lot fewer diamonds because now four of the diamonds are out here. So everyone thinks, okay, cool. Now is it gonna be a club? So no one's gonna bet on the jack. People are gonna bet on the club, but uh, now we're gonna see, sorry, get this right here. People think, mm, no. So this person's gonna be potentially out, but these people are gonna make back their money. But if it's a club here, but it's not, these people, I say, all right, so you lose yours, but since I said that the payout was gonna be two to one, you get 15 out of your five. You get 15 out of your five. You get 15 out of your five. So notice more often than not, what you're actually gonna be doing is the payout being one to one that it's any other result versus two to one on these sides. This is where math comes into play. And if you saw our episode on Dicey Games that came out recently, you are gonna find out that the odds are typically not in your favor. But what we see here is a development of games where they're still, again, games of chance. And in general, the house has made kind of small edge amount. People haven't lost a lot of money yet because they haven't really been betting fairly high. But now what happens when we escalate the game slightly differently. More on that in just one moment, because I'll need to take you into the history and the escalation of a game that is the true game of the Wild West. That's right, if you've seen a Western movie, you think, oh, wait a minute, they were playing poker. Not until towards the end of the Wild West period, the early Wild West period, they were playing Faro, F-A-R-O. Give me a second. So as I said, the true game of the Wild West was Faro, not poker, which wasn't invented in its current form until much later in the 19th century. So we're in the mid 19th century right now. Uh, now, 
This was also, again, before chips became a thing. So part of your bedding was actually stuff like, I don't know, small trinkets of gold? Kind of apropos for the Wild West period, wouldn't you think? So this game really had some popularity during the gold rush. What we're gonna be doing is taking elements of what we've already figured out as a game, and we are going to be seeing which card is going to be the one that wins. I want you to kind of combine in your head the concept of the set as well as Last Canet that we've already covered to this point. So now we are betting on which card will be paid out. So now we're just gonna make this simple. One, this person will bet on the five. This person will bet queen. Uh, this person will bet on the 10. You got some options here. Uh, much like before, you're once again betting on what comes out. This is a full deck. So I've included the spade suit, but some versions of Feral would actually exclude the spades. So here's kind of the catch. We're not going to be reshuffling. We're going to continue dealing. But your bet must stay until it is resolved. Win or lose. And once your bet resolves, then you don't get any sort of new payout. It's just one to one like before. But hey, your odds can't be that bad, right? Right. So what we're going to do is we are going to place one card on the left face up that will do nothing. Or eight. We're going to place one card to the right. This comes from the top. This card loses. Person lost their bet. The next card here wins. Well, nothing we can do there. So what we're going to do is we are going to put these cards to the side. We now know that eight, three, and five off the board. So we have 49 cards left out of our 52 card deck, four suits of 13. Let's see what happens next. This card does nothing, five. This card loses, nothing on it. This card wins, pays out one to one. Now. This person can then decide what to do. I can either just keep it there, but now you've got options here. Because okay, well, cool. I'm gonna take mine off. So we now know that two of the fives have been played. So okay, cool. Uh, three's been played, four's been played, and ace has been played. So let's say they say, you know what? I haven't seen the seven yet. Take my one. Place on the seven, this person says, cool, I'm gonna take my, uh, place it on, ah, eh, they'll place it on the king, why not? So notice you've got options on the board, part of the game will be paying attention to who has what on the board. So here's the fun catch now. Remember how with Beset, it was two out of every three cards lose. Only one out of every three cards wins, one out of every three cards loses, and one out of every three cards is kind of eh. So your odds of winning are the same, but your odds of losing are slightly lessened. So now, card that does nothing, our king. Card that loses, nine. Card that wins, three. Nothing here. After each round, you've got option to add to the pile because you think, okay, cool. Uh, three, now it's less. I'm going to put something there maybe, but we're just going to keep going. Two, does nothing. Five, loses. Seven, wins. So notice this person has done kind of okay for themselves. We keep on going. Now, really, there's not much reason to put five because it's unlikely to show up. Notice as the game goes on, you think, okay, queen hasn't played yet. King could maybe show up. The 10 could show up. The seven has less odds of showing up. King shown up, eight loses, queen wins. No, 
now they get to take their stuff off. So let's take a look from this person's perspective. They see that eights are less likely to show up, fives are less likely to show up. You're trying to find out where something will actually occur. So I have nine, I'm trying to see one that hasn't shown up yet. So the four has, the two has, the 10 hasn't. So they'll put something on the 10 here. Does everybody have at least one on something? Yes. So this person has two on the seven. So nine does nothing. 10, remember how they just put that bet there? Well, sorry, lost down. But the seven, however, they get their bet. This game will continue on. And now we've got fewer and fewer cards. Usually what would happen is uh, somebody would have like an abacus here and it would say, okay, you know, I'm gonna keep on this. And you think, okay, cool. This one card on some, well, what's gonna actually happen is people say, all right, the jack, the eight, the four, the five, then this person says, nah, I think it's going to be the queen, the six, the three, the ace, because that could show up. This person, I ah, know, I like your six. Oops, sorry. Six, the five, nine, seven. This person's going to do. So notice how it gets kind of crowded here. People are really hoping for that six to pop up. This shows up where now people have, as long as you remember where you placed your stuff, uh, four does nothing. Sorry, person down here. 10, that loses. Six, notice how everyone put that six over there. So this person kind of recouped their loss. So yeah, they lost the six. And each person says, I'm um, just keep that with me and keep that bet right there. Uh, people are like, all right, cool. Now let's see what's left. We'll just keep our stuff here for now. Three does nothing. Nine, that loses. Where's that nine? But what wins? That person wants a six. They want a five. They want a two. They want a seven. They don't get any of it. But notice how the bets can't be moved. So everything has its payout. So eventually what's going to happen is realizing that certain bets might not pay out because, well, how many threes are there left? So we'll do no more bets here and see what pays out. 10 does nothing. Queen loses. Ace wins. So this person lost on the queen, but they got their stuff back. We'll keep on going until we get to the end of the round. Five does nothing. Ace, well, sorry, almost gave that person money they shouldn't have had. Jack, that does, however, win. So eventually we'll get back to this point where there's only so much that can be left. Ten, nine, four. This person gets there one. But if you keep stuff kind of on here, you're going to see that over the course of a round, two does nothing, king loses, ace that has nothing on it because people didn't replace their bet, eight does nothing, seven loses. So notice eventually you're going to net lose if you don't replace those bets that you want. So here's where the fun strategy of the game takes place. Uh, six. One, eight, that's left. We're getting towards kind of the end here. King, three, that loses. Anything win? Jack does win. So we're getting towards the end. Jack, six, loses, six, wins. So notice how sometimes you can get unlucky. Notice we've got four cards left. 
usually what will happen sometimes is you'll get towards the end and you'll take this kind of last card out of play. There can be a special fun bet here. Now, the reason why there's an extra card is because I took that uh, suit of spades and I kept it in. If you took that out, you'd actually be left with only three cards. So you would actually get a special bet on the order of these three cards. That would be the thing that would pay out, and it would pay out at eight to one. This would require, and this is where our abacus would be helpful, you'd say, okay, I know there's a six left, I know there's an eight left, and there's 10 left. I'm gonna look here. There's two twos and a queen. So knowing the order, I know it on my end, but you get to say, all right, what's your bet of what's gonna pay out? And this person says, it's gonna be the two, the two, and the queen, and I'm gonna bet one. This person says, Yep, I'll take that. Two, two, and queen. Put one on it. She says, no, nah, it's going to be the two, the queen, and the two. This person says, no, nah, you're all wrong. It's going to be queen, two, two. Well, it's the two, the queen, and the two. Now, here's the catch. We know on our end, I didn't go into suits here, but that would still net them eight to one, so they get eight for their one and everybody else loses their bets now you think okay cool well, what about this stuff on here this is the only time within pharaoh typically that you would be allowed everybody gets their stuff back but notice though the house still kind of won there there ended up being more all i had to pay out was a little bit this is where, again, the house always wins. Notice how some people are kind of not doing too great over here. Yeah, this is the way that it works. And why, as you can kind of see, you could probably lose money really fast here, wouldn't it? Well, that, in a nutshell, is Fado. Now, as society progressed a little bit further and leisure time was actually able to be a thing for working classes, as well as this whole idea of disposable income, the working classes had an opportunity to learn and play games because not every waking hour was spent either in survival mode or some semblance of work mode. We also had the idea of tavern games, mutual meeting places. So you hear about a lot of tavern games and card games going pretty hand in hand. A second major space for the development of these games would also be England. Urban centers that allowed for leisure and specifically did not involve consist consistently being in the field became a huge, huge landing ground for as more people had disposable income, more people to learn and play games, which is why we see a massive explosion of different types of games that all go back to the same formats and origination. Banking games are just a starting point, hence why we have so, so many examples. And we just scratched the surface. So now we've got ourselves a new style of deck. Remember how I talked about French style decks? Well, I love bringing our German and Italian friends into this. Why? Their decks are slightly different and I definitely want to keep them included within this process. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and I'm gonna keep this at four players for now because I think that will be a little bit more clear for us moving forward. Yoink. Yoink and yoink. So we're gonna keep kind of referring to these players as suits. I'm gonna keep these shuffled ones here. We still have our shuffled double deck. Don't worry, we'll go back to that later. So we've got our German themed deck here. Their suits are slightly different and it's a slightly different number of cards. So first I'll go over the suits, which to me are just fun. We've got our 
leaves. We've got our hearts. We've got our, uh, this little hot air balloon thing is actually a bell and our acorns. So I'm gonna keep over to the acorns here and we've got ace, king, we've got the O, the U, 10, nine, eight, seven, and six. The five, four, three, two, and one technically don't necessarily exist here. But what we have are nine cards in each. We also have this O and U, and I'm sure you're thinking, what's going on here? Well, uh, you're gonna have to be familiar with the German here. Ober Unter. So what you have here is you've got what looks like a knightly character and you've got what looks like a more page-like character. So Oberst, which would be O-B-E-R-S-T, is our over, similar to our word. And then Unter, U-N-T-E-R, is going to be our lower card here. So what we're doing here is a game called Blind Hooky or Honest John. No relation. We're going to be creating piles of cards with one card left over for me here, the banker. The bottom card is the only card that matters. So I'm sure you're thinking, what does that possibly mean? Well, I'm going to create some piles here. And let's say we're going to create four piles for simplicity sake. So we're going to go ahead and start our shuffling. And all that's going to matter, again, is the bottom card. So everyone's going to place a stake. And I'm going to treat it the same way as we treated Lance Connect, where the banker says, all right, uh, we're just going to have five here. Nice, good, clean example. So everyone says, all right, cool. I'm matching that stake. And usually this would be with a certain number of players and that person who's the banker same stake, but I'm gonna just have four here so that way I can illustrate the concept that the house always wins. I'm gonna say it multiple times for obvious reasons. You can only cheat the system so much in that you can't. So, I'm gonna now make four piles and one card. And at one random point of my choosing, I'm going to deal one card into the middle. How about now? And we're going to deal with everything else. This is more of a speculation style game. And notice how, yes, it is uneven. And each person's going to make a bet as to the bottom cards. So I'm going to show you first eight. So eight is the possible stake. Let's actually make it divisible by four. How about that? Just to make it easier on all of our souls, myself included. So now here we are. Each person is going to determine. Let's see, and this is the potential winning here because payouts one to one here. Is this card going to be over or under eight. Now notice this is a pretty low number. If it had been the six, odds have been pretty good. So you think, okay, which of these piles is gonna have a card that is over eight? So if we know six, seven, and eight will lose, every other card will win. So let's say everybody does five on each individual pile in front of them. Let's see how it works out. Nine, Woo, close, but they win. 10, but they win. Obersch, but they win. Seven, this person loses. Now, this is a fairly simple kind of speculatory kind of game. And one that is done, uh, this was primarily with the German style deck. Notice you can still kind of do it with the French, but you could create multiple different piles. 
it's entirely speculatory, but it is a theoretically fun way to pass the time. Notice that I'm not replenishing people's stacks anymore. That's right. Some people are going to get into some trouble here. But easy enough, quick game, and let's do it with the French style real quick, just to illustrate the concept. So we're going to do the same here. I'm going to create five piles this time. One, two, three, four, five. Three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, and one. And what you could actually do, I'm doing it fairly evenly right now. But let's say, you know, let's make a sixth and seventh pile. All of these piles have certain numbers. This one doesn't have the same as the other four. And that is the number. Ooh, eight. I don't know. But let's say this person says, you know what? Uh, put six on here. Because why not? There's only a certain number of cards there. And we'll just do it like we did before. Uh, I'll put five on here. One. One. Nah, I'm good for the rest. This person says, actually, I'm going to put four on here and nothing else. This person's about to be out of ones. Uh, this person will put five here, five here. Again, it's a speculation theme game. It's like, you know what? Let's 25. I'm feeling it. Again, uh-oh, dangerous. This person says, I'm going to put one. Each and every single of these piles. So we'll go kind of in order here. Is it over or under eight? So we're looking specifically for over seven. Mm, nope. Sorry, no luck today. Now we'll look in this pile next. Put this over the side. Remember, we're looking for eight. It's only the bottom card that matters. Nine. So five here. Uh, that was one here. And what's this? One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, and four. But notice how dicey this game can be. Our relation to dicey. Now we know king. This one pays out too. So five. Each of these get one. Cool. We are well on our way. This gets removed. Uh, this person's really hoping this one works out. Ten. It does. So a one here and a 25 here. So this person actually technically caught the risk. They're doing okay. Let's take a look at this one. Ten. Not bad. This person got their stash of ones back. This person, on their hands, however, completely out of ones. Don't worry. We'll make change here in a minute. Four. Loses out. So this grouping turned out okay ish. Six below eight. This person lost out. Notice how this continues to be a game of chance and a game of luck. This is part of the way that these types of games have worked. They more often than not have turned out to be games where people can win or lose a lot of money. This is kind of the uh, fun, terrifying part, but more on that in a moment because there's one more game I want to show you today. One second. All right, so this one is also a, uh, a mild domestic gambling game is the direct quotation I read. Uh, this one was popular very quickly, but also faded away fairly quickly in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's called Speculation. Each player has three cards face down. The dealer, however, has one of their cards face up. This is the trump suit and the part that matters. The deal-in is 
six for the dealer. And sorry, uh, Mr. Club over there, I gotta break your stuff. Give you one back. Everyone else has four. So the dealer has kind of a stake in this. And notice I didn't change back. Hopefully you're gonna be able to see as stakes increase, especially next episode, when I'm going to increase the stakes, things are going to get uh, interesting. So now this person is six and they are trying to wager that they will have by the end, the highest in a Trump suit, which is now the hearts. Notice how there's only 12 cards. We are entirely speculating. So I'm gonna take a look, see here real quick. Look through the hearts and you're welcome to keep count at home, I suppose. But uh, you're more than welcome to find out along with me just how many. So remember, there's 13 in a suit. There are more than a couple of hearts in here. So now the speculation is that they are going to have the highest of that card. Actually, let me go ahead and put some stuff in order here real quick. that. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and determine that somebody, no one knows, by the way, uh, their cards. This is part of the speculation of the game. I will at least tell you that the four is not the highest, but they can choose to say, hmm, my card might be the highest and somebody can bet. This is the initial stake, by the way, but people can add stuff into it. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, what if it was just the ace? Yes, that is an immediate dealer win. This person says, mm, no, I don't want to buy that card. That four, I don't think is the highest. Play goes around. But this is the card that needs to be met. Now this person gets to turn over a card. Three of spades. They now know that they at least have slightly lesser odds. Let's see if we can find ourselves a heart. Nine. Now they can choose to either sell this card or keep it. So we now know that this person definitely does not have the highest card. So that might be some uh, reason to be involved with the speculation. Say, mm, I want to buy that card for 10. This person says, mm, I'll. 15, how about that, 15. This person has the option to buy this for 10 or 15. The other person says, no, I'm gonna put 25 on it. I'm gonna say 25 that you sell me this card. Person says, you know what, I'll take that. So they get 25 in their pot. This person is out the 25. Everybody gets their stuff back. And we see what happens now that this person has the speculation. So now another card turned over and another card turned over and another card turned over and a three. They know that's not the Trump. And what this would typically do is go around. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the nine is the highest that they had. So this person would then win all of that bet in the end. Not bad, right? And this is a fairly simplistic uh, version of it and why I'm willing to tell you that this game fell out of favor fairly quickly because of this reason. It is one of those games that can move fairly quickly, but notice how this was a very simplistic round and did not have exactly high stakes in it because once the person had the highest card, eh, there wasn't anywhere really to go with it. It was the third card that we saw and no one was gonna be willing to speculate until that other suit showed up. So uh, this is an example 
uh, for once of a game that didn't take off. Uh, we've talked a lot in this game about games that have died out over time or become less popular but still well known. This is one of those games that I haven't really seen anywhere else. It's shown up in my research for banking style games, but is probably one of the least prevalent. So I wanted to show you this game just because it does have some element of fun to it. However, it didn't take off like other ones. Oh well, games moved on. Because don't worry, we've got much more modern games to show you. I think that's better left for another episode. Don't you? It's fun to speculate. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to tune in next time as I am not done with banking games by any stretch of the imagination. Also, be sure to check out the playlist of every single episode on the National Public Library YouTube page. Look out for us on NECAT and look out for such other great NPL Universe content. I'll see you next time.